you know there's power in his name. There's something about the name Jesus. It's a good time to give him glory. It's a good time to give him honor. It's a good time to give him praise. Wonderful. Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God. The scripture that Deacon Nicholson read in your hearing is where I'm preaching from this morning. From John's Gospel, the Johannine text, John chapter 16, verses 23 through 24. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and it shall ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Simple but powerful subject this morning in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for this privilege to stand for the second time today and proclaim your word. It is my desire that I would preach with power, with accuracy, and most of all, with clarity of speech. I pray, O oh God, that you would anoint me afresh. Dear God. God, we are not building walls. We are tearing them down. And we pray that you would remove the walls that would hinder us from receiving and hearing your word on today. Speak now, for your servant is listening. Anoint me afresh. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In the sequel to the movie, God's Not Dead, God's Not Dead number two, the movie focuses on a high school teacher named Grace Wesley, played by Melissa Joan Hart. Miss Wesley, the teacher, was teaching a lesson on Dr. Martin Luther King's nonviolence approach to civil rights. She said, and I quote, what makes nonviolence so radical is this unwavering commitment to a nonviolent approach, end quote. A female student in the classroom asked the teacher, is that what Jesus meant when he said we should love our enemies? Need I remind you, the setting was a high school, and for a minute the class was quiet. The students were dumbfounded. Everyone was speechless. Without reservations, Miss Wessler, the teacher, Requoted the scripture in its entirety from Matthew 5 and 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. No one could believe that she named or called out or referenced the name of Jesus in public particularly in a public classroom. They found it quite audacious that she would mention and further elaborate on, Dr. Uh, on Jesus' name and tie it to Dr. King's legacy. One student texted his parents. The parents contacted the Board of Education, and in just a few days, she was called in and began uh, a line of lawsuits for using the name Jesus. They said to her that the name of Jesus would not be tolerated. From there, Miss Wesley's career stood in jeopardy. She was fired, as you know, if you watched the movie, from her position. And the board also appealed to the board to have her license revoked. In order to save her career, she ended up in court. In the context of the movie, Reverend Respus, the antagonist, wanted to argue that the God that she was referencing is dead. In the end, for those of you who watched the movie, Miss Wesley is declared, cleared, excuse me, of all of her charges. When the evidence has been presented, one of the jurors, one of the key jurors, became ill. And a replacement juror had to be called in. And as the Lord would have it, the replacement juror was a born-again Christian. 
who said, I am taking a stand for Jesus. Miss Wesley is found not guilty, and the movie ends in celebration. I am sure you are asking, Pastor Henry, uh, that was just a movie, or rather stating that was just a movie. What captured my attention, Kashila, was not just a movie, but an interview with Melissa Hart at another time. She says she felt as though she was chosen by God for the part. She asked the question, how can we as Christians not say the name of Jesus? I'm going to say that again because some of y'all are asleep. She said, how can we as Christians not say the name of Jesus? Choir, I help you sing, now you help me preach. She said, how can we as Christians not say the name of Jesus? Her thoughts came to me, Sister Melvin, recently, as I am always asked to pray at public functions. And you need to know that I keep declining. And I'm declining for a reason. One of the more recent letters that I received is on my desk. I did pray over it, and then I just left it there. And that is, now they are coming with special requests. And they're saying, we want you to pray from two to three minutes, not over and not less. And they are underlining, please make sure that you do not pray in the name of Jesus. It seems that the name Jesus is offensive to many. And therefore, we are asked to avoid using his name. I wish I had somebody to help me. So, I am expected to lay my personal relationship aside and forget about my Savior and not mention his name. That's like Miss Henry, my wife over here. Stand up, Jack, if you don't mind. If I was to say, well, that's my wife. And I just repeatedly say, that's my wife. At some point, I ought to be able to acknowledge her as Jackie Bell Henry because that's her name. I wish I had somebody to help me. So for you to ask me to pray in public and to refuse to call my Savior's name, you are being offensive to me. That's my Savior. I have a relationship with him. That's who woke me up this morning. That's who's keeping me. That's who preserved my life. That's where I get my help from. So I refuse not to mention his name. Now I know this is being televised and I want to make clear that my colleagues that are watching understand that I have been theologically trained and I'm aware of that. I'm also respectful of the other uh, denominations other religions, and I will not bash or disrespect any of them. If I'm in a setting where my Islamic brothers are called on to pray, I respect and fully understand that they would pray in the name of Allah. They have a relationship with him. If I'm in a setting where my Catholic friends are and they're praying, I expect them, they practice what? Catholicism, to say, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And they would appeal to Mary as their intercessor. And I don't have any problems with that because that's what they believe. If I'm in a setting with Buddhists, then I would expect them to pray to Buddha because that's who they have a relationship with. Well, I'm in a relationship with Jesus. Y'all do know him, don't you? And since I'm in a relationship with him, I wish I had somebody help me. I have to call I need to call. It's urgent that I call. It's necessary that I call. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. And since I know him personally, it is required of me to call his name. Preacher, why? His name grants us access. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple things that they no points, but just the fact that his name grants us access. That's the first thing. And not only does it grant us access, but when we enter in, we go into his presence. And then we enter into his presence, we establish a relationship. And then that relationship grows to fellowship. Y'all didn't get that. So if you want to write down four things a day, there they are. Access. Come on, somebody. Presence. Relationship. And then fellowship. 
Access. I know you're paying. Well, what are you talking about? Will you emphasize? Will you elaborate on access? I'm glad you want me to. And that is because of prayer is a form of communication. The purpose of prayer is to connect with God. Are y'all with me? We hollow his name. We reverence his name. We give his name glory. We give his name the glory and honor that he rightfully deserves. But in order for me to talk to my father, I have to have access. And because we are more, nothing more than filthy rags, y'all don't hear me, we are not righteous enough to approach the throne of God. But thank God this morning, Sister Manny Holmes, we have an intercessor. I wish I had somebody who knows what I'm talking about. And that is, I talk to Jesus. And Jesus talks to his father. I call his name and he goes to his father's on my behalf. So why wouldn't I call his name? How well do you remember Rachel Scott, who was the first student murdered in 1999, April 20th to be exact in the Columbine shooting. Rachel stood firm on her relationship with Jesus and would not deny her faith by, the, by not calling or mentioning his name. Perhaps she had read Matthew 10 and 33, and this is going to make some folk upset. But the ushers will let you out if you need to go. And that is Jesus said. And Matthew 10 and 33, whosoever shall deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. Now, the New Living Translation, he says, if you deny me on earth, I will deny you before my father. That means if you don't say my name and call me who I am, I wish I had to my heaven. When you get to heaven, if you get there, I will disown you because you refuse to acknowledge my name. That's our text this morning. It's part of what is called the farewell discourse. You've heard me mention that enough that most of you know what I mean when I say that. Anytime you're studying John's gospel, John 14, John 15, John 16, and John 17, that entire narrative there is known as the farewell discourse. In John 14, Jesus reassures his disciples that I'm leaving you but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. At the latter part of 14, he begins to elaborate on the comforter. And he expresses the uh, need that he must leave. In fact, he said, it is expedient that I go to my father. Because if I don't return, my father won't spend, excuse me, won't send the comforter. Let me slow down. John 16, he begins, 15, he begins the narrative about the vine and the branches. Are y'all with me? He wants the, the disciples to fully understand the importance of staying connected. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Sister Murphy, he ends that narrative by saying, without me, you can do nothing. What he's saying to the disciples, if you try to live a life that is detached from me, you will not survive. And John 16, he goes further and elaborates more on the comforter that he will send in his name. Then in John 17, he have the great prayer of intercession. Jesus intercedes to his father on our behalf. He prays not only for the believers in John's gospel and the disciples, but he prays for all future believers. Y'all are the help men here. But specifically in John 16, Verse 23, he says, and in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father. Y'all ought to help me in here. In my name, he will give it to you. Now, Sister Jared, somebody said, well, what do you mean by that day? Well, you got to remember in the context of the three years that the disciples walked with Jesus, they never prayed to him because they didn't know really who he was. It was not until after he came back, I wish I had somebody hit me, that they admitted that he indeed is the Messiah. So Jesus is talking about future tense. He says, the day will come when you will talk to our Father, are y'all with me? And you will take your concerns, your prayers, your issues to him. 
But he says, if you really want to connect with our Father, use my name. God knows I wish I had somebody help me. In other words, he says, my name is the key that unlocks the door. And if you want to connect with the Father, you've got to go through Jesus. So why wouldn't I mention his name? Preacher, have you lost it? No. And what really intrigued me was the fact that because Jesus gave the disciples the right to use his name, many of you are not aware, but we have power of attorney. I know y'all sitting here saying, I didn't know I had that. Power of attorney, that is the right to act on somebody else's behalf. That means as believers, Jesus is our agent. God knows I wish I had somebody help me. And whatever we need, we have the right. A power of attorney is a signed document that you can stand in somebody else's place. It's signed in black ink with what authenticates the authority of the signer. Well, this document that I'm talking about was not signed in black ink, but rather it was signed in red blood on a Friday evening. And Jesus gives us the right to use his name. God knows I wish I had somebody to talk to me. Use his name. Pastor, why in the world would I want to use his name? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Anybody ever tried it? Anyone ever called his name? One day Peter and John were on their way to the temple. The Bible says at the ninth hour, the Bible says that as they journeyed, they came in contact with a man who was a paralegic, who was waiting at the gate, and he was begging arms and wanted them to give him something, some change or some money out of his pocket. Can I get somebody to help me? Peter stood up and said, silver and gold, I do not have but one thing that I have, I will give it to you in the name of Jesus. I think somebody knows something about that name. Rise up and walk. Are y'all with me? There's power in his name. In the book of Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John were arrested, they told Peter, we don't want you to mention the name Jesus. Don't use it when you teach. Don't use it when you preach. Don't call his name. Peter said, how can we not call on his name? I wish you'd tell somebody sit beside you, that name is the name that I call when my back is against the wall. That name is a strong tower. That name is my rock. That name is my sword. That name is my sheep. Is there anybody here not ashamed to call on the name of Jesus? It is in his name. that we have access and we are able to establish a relationship when we enter into his presence. Oh, I haven't started preaching yet. Luke 17, the 70 disciples came back saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, There is salvation and no other name under the heaven by which men can be saved except through the name of Jesus. I wish somebody would talk to me. Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords. Anybody in here know that name? Has anybody in here ever tried him? Has anybody here ever called him in the midnight hour? When your back was against the wall? Anybody ever been sick and thought you couldn't wear it? But the name of Jesus provided the healing that you needed. Is there anybody in here? I'm not talking about folk who just come to church. Who know him by his name who've called him by his name, who have a relationship with him. (laughs) 
his name. The name Jesus gives me access so I can dwell, gosh, in his presence. In the Old Testament, they had the Ark of the Covenant as a symbol of his presence. And they believed that everywhere the Ark went, that the presence of God would go. Well, I've got some good news. You don't have to wait until you come to church on Sunday morning to get in the presence of Jesus. If you want to know the truth, he and I had a meeting early this morning. I talked to him this morning, and he talked with me. And wherever you are, you've got the privilege to have a relationship with him because you've been in his presence. Now, if you want to put something on Facebook, I'm going to give you something to put on Facebook. Not only will access get me into his presence, and access gives me access to him, and I can establish a relationship. I'm old enough now, at 53, to understand that I would rather have relationship over religion. Mm. I know some of your lifelong Baptists got upset and you turn it over in your seat. But I've got enough audacity to say it again. I'd rather have relationship over religion any day. Religious folk can act religious on one instant. Turn around and act like a fool on another one. I wish I had somebody to help me. But when you have a relationship Anybody know what I'm talking to? You don't have to wait the Sunday morning to have church. You can have church right by yourself. Is anybody here ever been in the presence of the Lord where the spirit of the Lord is? There is liberty. Is there anybody here? I'm talking to some real folk who had rather have relationship over religion because where religion ends, relationship begins. I know what you're going to do. I feel it. Some of y'all will be texting the deacons later on tonight. Y'all need to talk to Pastor Henry. He's losing his mind. He's bashing the church. I am not. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. That people now who are seeker sensitive are no longer looking for an organized church. Y'all didn't get that. I know the scripture was read earlier this morning. Upon this rock, Reverend Caldwell said that the Lord said, I will build my church. But you need to understand the church is not a building. Come on, somebody. The church is called the ecclesia, the called out body of Christ. It is a group of believers. Oh, I see some folks sliding down. Relationship is essential to our salvation. Y'all don't want to hear this. As a chaplain, when you go to the hospital, back in the day we had access to your records, not your medical file. Let me make that clear. But it would list your name, and your affiliation. Are y'all with me? So that way, if someone was affiliated with the uh, 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 Catholic Church, then we were expected to call in a priest. If they were Protestant, then that's where I would step in. Y'all need to hear this. All right? Now, 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 when you are sick, and you tell the doctor, I'm a Baptist, that may not get you anywhere. But if you tell them, my relationship is with the Savior. You are doing the surgery, but the Lord is doing the healing. I, I wish I had somebody to talk about. So I'm trying to get you to understand the importance of relationship over religion. Oh, y'all died on me right there. Access gets me into his presence. Come on, somebody. And when I get into his presence, 
we build a relationship. You don't build a relationship because you got married Saturday and went to the Bahamas net last week and you've been married one week. Your relationship is progressive. It has to grow. Mrs. Henry and I are over 30 years now. And there are days we still have to work on what? I saw some of y'all. So the name of Jesus gives me access. You can't get into his presence without going through Jesus. And I want to inform some of you that you are doing yourselves a bad disservice by referring to him as the man upstairs, my big brother. That's not his name. My, my house has a second floor. There are times I am the man upstairs. Y'all didn't get that, did you? But when you refer to him, you ought to call him by his name. He's not bruh bruh. His name is Jesus. That's the name that the angel told Mary. And you will call him Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. We ought to respect and honor his name. Or oh, it's tight in here now. We have access into his presence. Dr. Oso, I'm getting ready to close. If you get the picture ready in the back, we have access to his presence. And then we build a relationship. And then once we have a relationship, we begin to fellowship. Anybody know what fellowshipping is? Fellowshipping is togetherness. It is unity. It is walking hand in hand. There's no better picture than that when you turn to Revelation 3 and 20. When Jesus closes the book of Revelation. And says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, if there's a shout in the house, you ought to shout because of what he said. If any man, any black man, any white man, any Jew, any Gentile, any former user, regardless of your past, regardless of where you've been, if any man will open the door, he said, I will come in. God knows I wish I had somebody else. And not only will I come in, but he said I will sup with him. It means I will dine with him. I will fellowship with him. We will become as one. Wow. Three years ago, when I began my work in Liberia as president of the Baptist Theological Seminary, one day I was in the library and I received a phone call. Dr. Olu Menje said, Pastor Henry, in that context, Dr. Henry, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm in the library reading, working on the sermon for when I get back home. And he said, if you got some time, I want you to go back to the house and get dressed. He said, make sure you wear a tie. If you got a sports coat or something, throw on something. And I want you to take a ride with me. He said, Dr. Henry, make sure you bring your passport. And make sure you bring your ID. Because you're going to need your passport and your ID as to where we're going. Come on, somebody, and talk to me. I got in the car. The driver picked me up and carried me uh, to this building that looked like the White House. And finally, when I arrived there, Dr. Menje said, Dr. Henry, today you are meeting the Honorable Joseph Borka, who is the Vice President of Liberia. I have arranged the visit. So all we've got to do is go through security. But Dr. Minje did not go in the building the same time that I did because one of the senators of the province where the seminary is held him up and he was talking with the senator. So he told me to go ahead. But when I got to the gate, the security guard looked at my passport and knew that I was not a native Liberian. And he said, your uh, presence is denied. Your access is denied. You cannot get in to see the vice president. I just stood there, and finally Minji stepped up and said, I am Olu Minji, president of the Baptist Convention, and that's Dr. Terry Henry, president of the seminary. He said, I'm going to sign off and allow him to go in. 
he has access unto my knee. Can I get a witness? And finally, when we got in the room, I had the opportunity to sit down and fellowship with the Honorable Joseph Boycott. Somebody ought to know where I'm going. And finally, when we got out of that section, I moved on and I had a conversation with him. He said, Dr. Henry, you no longer have to go through Menjay. But when you make a return trip to the country, all you got to do is call me on my private phone. And I'll have you over to the house. If you can get the picture up, I'd appreciate it. And now when I go, I don't have to go through Menjay. I have access to Borkheim right by myself. When I go in just a few months, I'll be there. And I've already been invited to have lunch with Joseph Borka. Well, I told that to tell somebody. It's if you establish a relationship with Jesus and you get to know him for yourself. You don't have to go through your mama or your daddy or your brother or your sister. You've got access in the name of Jesus to go directly to him. That's because the Honorable Joseph Borka and I have established a relationship and now we fellowship and I have access to him. So as you stand today, they finally got the picture up. That's the vice president of Liberia in the middle. And I'm to the left. And Dr. Minjay, who gave me access, is to the right of the Honorable Joseph Borka. I didn't show you that to impress you with a picture. I showed you that to let you know I got access through Minjay to get to the vice president's office. And if you want to go to God, if you want access to God, you've got to go through Jesus. I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Wow. So I know there are preachers standing in line who are ready to pray, who are ready to compromise their faith just to be in the public scene. I'm too old now to sell out my Savior for a chance to pray at a council meeting or any other meeting. If you can call your God, I ought to be able to call mine. And I ought not have to walk in fear when I choose to mention his name. The hymn writer picked it up some years ago. And say, there's a name I love to hear. I love to sing this word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me.